This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 931, recorded on August 26, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, everybody. Um, again, it's one of those days that looks really, really nice outside, but don't bother unless you've got a, a, a special raincoat that's got air conditioning built into it or something because it's really hot and humid out there right now. Did you have a storm? I heard thunder before outside. Did oh, you have that? Not where I am, but... Um, I mean, that, that's how localized this stuff is. I guess it's, yeah, yeah. it might be closer to you than me. No, Brian, you hear any thunder? <laughs> uh, no. but a, Did the earth move for you? <laughs> no, but a, I was talking to a colleague earlier who lives a little south of here, and she was having a storm at the time. I hope we get one because we could use one. From Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi. Um, it is not storming here. It is sunny and 90 Fahrenheit, 32 wow. Celsius. Um, so I'll take that, I suppose. From Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 26 Celsius, uh, 77 Fahrenheit, gentle breeze from the north. It's very pleasant. <laughs> gentle breeze from the north. And it's 27C here. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It is uh, 75 Fahrenheit, 24C here, and we have a big series of lines of thunderstorms moving through. Are and I was we on just the looking. Side of this front? <laughs> I was just looking at the at the um, app that I use, the aviation app that I use, which gives good radar information, and and we had actually two major pieces of this line of thunderstorms pass one to the north and one to the south and we went right through the gap in between and now there's there's more there's now there's more more coming we've got flash flood warnings all over the state mm. drought to flood that's the yep. whole deal nowadays isn't it now we have a listener who identifies herself as martha from eastern massachusetts <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm glad they have to. I'm glad they have to distinguish now. They do. It's a riff on your stuff, you know. I yes. like that. I really like that. Well, they're so accustomed to just saying they're from Massachusetts, like you know, the whole state is Boston. So, <laughs> is it Boston? Boston. Yeah. All right. We have two stories for you today. The first has to do with polio, which perhaps you know has been in the news lately. And so uh, we're going to talk about a uh, report in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, MMWR, a publication of the CDC, entitled Genetic Characterization of Novel Oral Polio Vaccine Type 2 Viruses During Initial Use Phase Under Emergency Use Listing Worldwide March through October 2021. The titles of these are always, they're just... They're not like our titles. Let's put it that way. There's <laughs> a formula you. to that. They've they've got a they they've got a set thing that they've got to fill out, and so they uh, like the worldwide March to October 2021. They have to say where yeah. the yeah. thing is and the what the time period was. Yeah. And it's fine. It's yeah. Fine. Uh, so this is uh, a report on how this new OPV and OPV two is faring. And so just to remind you, we did do an episode. 756, where we talked about uh, this new a new OPV2, and um, it's been it's been a, it's a virus a derivative of oral polio vaccine uh, that's been made in the lab and tested in people. And so, just to remind you, there are two vaccines that we can use for polio virus uh, prevention. We can use an inactivated vaccine, which is non-replicating; hence, it's inactivated. And that's what we use here in the U.S. and in a number of other countries. And then there's oral polio vaccine. And that one is infectious. You take it, you drink it, and uh, it reproduces in your intestines. You shed it out. And the problem with that one is, well, it's a really good vaccine, except uh, upon reproduction in the gut, it reverts to be able to cause 
poliomyelitis. It does so in every recipient, and something like one in one and a half million recipients end up getting polio. But more, more importantly, those viruses are shed into uh, the wastewater, and they can transmit through the population, as we've been talking about in the last few weeks. And in fact, it's one of those OPV2-derived viruses that uh, cause the paralysis of the person in Rockland County, New York. So, you know, WHO uses OPV for its eradication effort. It's very easy to administer. It's cheap. And so a number of years ago, the idea was floated, can we make a modified version that doesn't revert or reverts less frequently, right? And so that was NOPV2. And this was made by a number of different laboratories based on a lot of, you know, fundamental molecular biology that was sorted out over probably two decades Starting from and the this 80s. is only the the NOPV two indicates it's only one serotype of polio, right? Right. Yeah, there are which three. happens to be the one that's the most problematic to deal with. Yeah. So wild type polio viruses. So people may ask, what's wild type? Well, it's the viruses that were circulating and infecting people before we had any vaccines, right? And um, that's what we call wild type. So types two and three, wild types two and three, have been eradicated. At least we think. Right, as far as we can tell, there's none of as them As far around. as we know. <laughs> and it is only wild type one that continues to circulate. Not a lot of cases. But, and you know, because of the eradication of type two, they removed the type two from the OPV vaccine. So now most people who are getting OPV get a bivalent formulation of one and three. Okay. However, that was done in, in 2016 and... The problem is there were outbreaks subsequently of type 2 vaccine-derived virus. Uh, and so to quell those, they go back in with type 2 OPV and they reintroduce OPV and it continues to circulate. And, and complicating matters is the fact that IPV doesn't immunize the gut. So in other countries, these, these vaccine-derived viruses can be imported. They wouldn't be an issue if they didn't cause paralysis, Right. We wouldn't right, care if right, they didn't cause right. paralysis if they kept circulating, but they do. And so, That's true. hence the, the formulation of, of NOPV. And, and as we discussed in that episode, it's a wonderful culmination of years and years of molecular biology, fundamental research to make modifications that we think will reduce the reversion uh, to new revirulence. <laughs> and the, the, one of the main papers that we discussed in that episode is engineering the live attenuated polio vaccine to prevent reversion to virulence. Um, and the, the, there are three main kinds of changes that were introduced. The main determinant of attenuation, that is the, the reduced ability to cause paralysis, is in the five prime untranslated region. And it, it's in a similar area for all three serotypes. For, for the type three, it's 472, base 472 for type two, it's base 481. And so they made changes around that area, which would make it hard for that base to revert. So in type 2, 481, and, and the problem is that this happens in every kid, right? As soon as you take these vaccines within 24 hours, that 481 uh, has reverted. So the, the wild type sequence is an A, the, uh, sorry, the, the, I can't remember. A to G. G is the wild type sequence. A is the attenuated version. And so it, this is actually in a stem loop. So you can modify the stem loop in a way that if it did revert, there would be a problem with the base pairing of the stem loop. So it, it, it's very hard for it to revert. Okay. And, and studies in cell culture and in mice suggested that it wasn't reverting. And whereas again, with Sabin 2, as soon as you, uh, Put it into a kid, it reverts. In fact, you could pass it in the laboratory in HeLa cells at 37 degrees and it will revert after one or two passes. There's just some selection for that original base in, in terms of fitness. All right, so changes in the 5' UTR. The second thing has to do with um, a stem loop structure internal in the genome in one of the proteins called 2C. This is called the CRE, cis-acting replication element. It's a stem loop that is needed for RNA synthesis. And um, so what this, they, they inactivated it and moved it to the five prime UTR, basically. So if you inactivate this Cree, the virus won't replicate. 
Uh, but if you move it next to the five prime UTR, it will work because actually it can work wherever it is in the genome. It doesn't matter where it's located. And the reason they did this is to avoid the scenario where when you take these viruses, these OPVs, they, they can recombine in your intestine with other enteroviruses that are there. We all have enteroviruses in our intestines. And a scenario could arise where a five prime UTR could could be re the five prime UTR, the vaccine strain could be replaced with one of these enteros, only the five prime UTR, keeping the Cre and the rest of the type two genome. So they figure by putting the Cre next to the five prime UTR attenuation region, they could minimize that. Okay. And finally, they introduced uh, amino acid changes at two positions in the RNA polymerase, one position that improves the fidelity. So the enzyme makes fewer mistakes and the other position reduces the recombination rate, again, to try and reduce the recombination with other enteroviruses uh, in your intestines. Okay. So all of these things were learned in different laboratories over many years. And I just love, it's all put together to make a better OPV, I guess. Right. So right. the, the so idea Vincent, is how that- much of this could Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. I was just going to ask how much of what you just said could have been or was done in vitro by mixing various enteroviruses together with poliovirus that you've altered and looking for hybrids in cell culture? Well, this was done in a very directed manner. We They introduced changes into a DNA, an infectious DNA copy of the virus RNA and then characterize the virus. So they didn't have to rely on recombination or any of that. No, but I, I think, I think if you, you suggested that you were worried about this uh, particular strain of vaccine. Once it gets into the gut uh, and yes, starts replicating, yes. even if it's slow, right. it could hybridize. So couldn't you estimate that first in cell culture? Well, they did, yes. they did to a certain extent. They did some, you know, they passaged it and they said, oh, the, the five prime end doesn't revert. They they co-infected with enteroviruses and they didn't see recombination, right? So there's a suggestion that it was better, but, you know, the ultimate experiment is putting it in millions and millions of, of intestines, sure. right? And that's so I had one more question, yeah. and that is, as a non-virologist, the non-translated region of a genome of a virus is essential for the virus nonetheless. How does that work? Yeah, so, you know, in any genome, there are regions that are not translated into protein, and they can be essential for a variety of reasons. For poliovirus, the untranslated regions are needed for translation of the protein. They're structures that direct the ribosomes to the RNA. They're, they're, they're regions that are needed for the polymerase to interact with the RNA, those sorts of you things. physically rather than making a copy of itself. Right. Yes. Yeah. Physical. In order to get the party started, you've got to start translating this because it <laughs> comes in comes in as just a messenger RNA, but it doesn't. It's not built properly to be just interpreted as a messenger RNA by the cell. So there are these structures in the UTR that that pull in the ribosomes to start translation on this atypical template. So the so um, I have a, go ahead. I have a question about the uh, improving the fidelity of the uh, polymerase. It, they must have done it just the Goldilocks amount because if they if they improve the fidelity too much, it would be deleterious for the virus. Absolutely so, right, correct. I, so yeah. I don't, I, I didn't go back and look at the original paper, but did, did they have varieties of uh, fidelity to choose from? Do you think, or do you remember? No. Okay. They, they had. I think there was probably some tinkering going on there. So what they did was <laughs> the way this this amino acid was identified. So it was identified independently by Carla Kierkegaard and Raul Landino. They made they selected poliovirus resistant to ribavirin. Ribavirin is a mutagen. So they found a single amino acid change in the polymerase that reduces the error frequency. That's what makes it resistant to ribavirin. Right? It's resistant to lethal mutagenesis. And okay. Subsequently, another residue was found elsewhere, but they didn't do any tinkering. Those viruses, so that virus with the one amino acid change cannot compete with wild type virus. If you do competition assays, it loses. It's less fit as you as you suggested. And so if you made it a perfect <laughs> polymerase, which never made any mistakes, it would probably never, never, ever. Uh, compete at all. So, 
I mean, that's an interesting yeah. point because it may be that there's going to be selection. I mean, we haven't seen it, as you will see, but there might be selection for reversion at that position. It's a single amino right. acid change. Wouldn't take much, right? No. Perfect uh, is the enemy of infectivity. Is this, no, that's not how that's saying. <laughs> no. um, and if listeners want to know more about this Goldilocks um, issue with fidelity in the polymerase, I remember uh, one episode with Craig Cameron um, yes, right. where uh, right. he, he talked quite a bit about this. Right. So this uh, MMWR now is um, a result of a study. So the where they where they looked at these this NOPV two. So this is one candidate, and it's called NOPV two. Um, right. So what they, they just to put people's minds at ease, we talked about in vitro experiments, and uh, they also went into transgenic mice, and they did yeah. uh, before all of this to get the emergency use listing. They tested it in a small group of people, mm -hmm. found it didn't hurt anybody, and it produced. Um, what's called non-inferior immune responses. You don't have to be better than the current vaccine. You just have to not be worse. I think Merchlinsky um, so called that immunobridging, right? Right. Isn't that the word he used? Yes, it, it's, a, it's a bridging study to show, <laughs> all right, this is, this is, we believe, as good as the current standard yeah. of care. Because you can't just do a normal phase one, two, three clinical trial in an environment where you need to vaccinate people against polio. Um, you can't have your unvaccinated placebo group that would be unethical yeah also there are not so enough they, cases to do yeah not enough cases to to it would take years so they they did this shortened approach uh which allowed the emergency use listing and then they took it to um to a very very large scale so part of the emergency use listing which was issued in november 2020, in which most people didn't notice because we're in the middle of a pandemic. We had other viruses we were talking about, <laughs> yes. But part of that EUL is a plan for monitoring, okay, saying, all right, we're going to use this vaccine in the field, but we have to collect isolates and analyze them and see uh, what their properties are. And this is the first report of that. And this is really impressive. 111 million doses of NOPV2 have been administered in this first phase, Mar March through October yeah. 2021. So they collected 128 NOPV2 isolates from stool. This is part of routine uh, surveillance for acute flaccid paralysis from six different countries. Uh, and 123 isolates from 39 environmental surveillance samples from seven countries. And then they ge they generated whole genome sequences, whole viral genome sequences from uh, these 251 NOPV2 isolates. They're all isolated in culture. These are viruses, infectious viruses isolated in culture. Okay. This is not just PCR. Yes. It's not PCR. Uh, and they part of the part of this um, study is looking at the interval. So when you have an outbreak of polio somewhere, you go in with what they call supplementary, supplementary immunization. And th that's called the Supplementary Immunization Activity, or SIA. And then you start collecting uh, samples. And so the, the time between SIA and when you collect the sample uh, varies. It, it varies from zero to 81 days, um, which, which is important because obviously you're giving the virus more time to reproduce. So then they sequence the genome, as I said, they look at all the changes and they put these viruses into nine categories based on uh, what kinds of changes they see in the genome. And they have a figure which has a flow chart for, you know, all the different things that could happen. Uh, so category nine is no changes from NOPV2. So 32 of these isolates, 13% had no changes from NOPV2. And uh, 213 or 85% uh, were category eight, which had no reversion in the two eight, 481 base in the five prime UTR, no recombination, and between zero and five substitutions in VP1. And they do use the word VP1 substitutions instead of VP1 mutations, which most other people would do. <laughs> And I'm so happy. This has made my Maybe day. Maybe they listen to Twiv. Yeah. And, I, yeah, and, and this. I was just going to say, people should him. note that at this point, we have um, accounted for 98% of the isolates. Yes. 
And this is really, um, given what we were just discussing, I just want to emphasize how awesome this is, because if you give regular OPV2 to a similar size population, it's just all revertants all coming reverted. out, right? All I mean, reverted. they all right. revert to be to be virulent. And this is just not happening. No, it's great. <laughs> it's really good. By the way, I just want to take a little side here, right? Two minutes. I reviewed a paper a couple of weeks ago where they kept saying, you know, mutations in this protein. And I wrote in my <laughs> review, you cannot do that. <laughs> Mutation is a nucleic acid. And I said, there is no arguing with this, with this, okay? <laughs> they actually changed every incidence. I was amazed. They Thanks. did it. Good. Thank yeah, you. But you were you. right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and there's global search and replace. So yes. it makes it <laughs> it's not hard. It's not hard. In other words, yeah, yeah. Right. I just was very because I, I people like to fight about it. I mean, I have colleagues at work who fight with me. Oh, it's it's accepted use. No, it's not accepted use. Come on. Okay. How many authors on the paper, Vincent? There were just a couple. Ah. And just because everybody else is doing it wrong doesn't mean you should. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, so as uh, none of these isolates, as Alan said, have changes at that 481. And if this were OPV, every kid would have had that reverted. Absolutely. Um, and the most frequent mutations were at nucleotide positions that have been shown to slightly decrease attenuation when present individually. And the, these individual genomes had from zero to five of these in different uh, combinations. Uh, sometimes there were second site mutations that compensate for each of them. Um, but th this is the interesting point. The number of mutations increased with time after the SIA campaigns, right? So as I said, this is from zero to 81 days after the SIA. And the samples taken further and further away from the SIA have more mutations in them. Um, and they found a higher frequency of mutations uh, in isolates from environmental surveillance rather than uh, from AFP isolates. So AFP, a, a kid will have uh, some kind of limb weakness, which they call acute flaccid paralysis. And then they will take a stool sample and ask, um, is there poliovirus there? And so from some of those, they got these NOPV2s, but uh, they had fewer changes in those compared to environmental surveillance. And it makes sense because what's in the environment has been passed around from person to person. Now, they didn't check any of these viruses for neurovirulence using poliotransgenic mice, but they do say most are similar to viruses uh, that were shed in the clinical trials in people. And they checked those in mice and they were not more virulent. So I think that's probably fine. Um, uh, let's see. In addition to these NOP2, NOPV2, during this surveillance, they got whole genome sequences of 331 circulating VD vaccine-derived poliovirus 2, all right, not derived from NOPV, but from the regular OPV2, um, from outbreaks in countries that were geographically associated with uh, NOPV2 use. And none of those had any of the changes introduced into uh, NOPV2. So they're saying there's no recombination that they're detecting between uh, the different the OPV2s that are out there. So this is a good start. Um, they say, you know, this is we we need to do more surveillance, but it's a good start, and it's uh, actually what is the word they use? It it shows superior genetic stability of this. Uh, five prime UTR compared with Sabin OPV2, which is absolutely correct. Yeah, and uh -huh. um, just so the there was no recombination with the o, between the OPV2s, but the NOPV2 can recombine with some other viruses. Yes, right, they can. Yeah, and they found they found those. So I've so, used if you use this just this vaccine throughout the whole world for the right. next ten years, do you think you could eradicate polio? So that's a good question. And now the that's plan is, the, by the that's way, the plan. <laughs> the plan is to make NOPV one and three. All right, because those can revert as well. But this is obviously the biggest problem too. So the question is, in a world where guts are susceptible to poliovirus, in a world where guts are susceptible <laughs> to poliovirus, <laughs> if you use NOP, NO, NOPVs, okay. Well, the first question is, would they revert eventually? 
because they say in their in their limitations of this report, time since first use is one of the main factors in evolution. Thus, ongoing monitors will be important to confirm or modify these observations. It could be in a year they find reversion, right? It just takes time. Yeah, yeah that was in fact going to be my question was what kind of timing would you think would be adequate for this? I think a year is a good amount of time to to tell, but obviously they have to go longer because, yeah, I think the plan is eventually to give these countries NOPVs. And then the question is if, if all right, so there's two things. One, do they revert? You know, I have, a, I just find it hard to think it won't revert at one point, right? But we'll see. The other is, are they going to keep circulating like NOPV2 does at the moment, right? Wherever in the U.S., there's... NOPV2 in New York, right? We looked OPV2. for it. We found it. Sorry, yeah. Kathy, what? But there's OPV, OPV2. not NOPV. Sorry, there's OPV2 yeah. in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the question is, would NOPV have the same fitness? I, I don't think we know, right? Yeah. That's the hope, I and suppose. How long, and how long is regular OPV going to keep circulating? Um, it's out there, the right? Environment because yeah. it's out there, and in countries that use that have switched to IPV because they can, which is really the reason you switch to IPV, that you have the infrastructure to deliver it, and then you you eliminate this risk of paralysis mm -hmm. even in a small mm -hmm. number of people. Um, but then you have people walking around where most people can be carriers, and you've got you've got wild type OPV two in the sewage and at the playground and just circulating the population probably. Um, and how long is that going to, I don't see a reason why that's going to stop. Yeah, I don't either. I agree. I mean, it, I, it didn't, it didn't in the preceding 2000 years before the vaccines were developed. Right. So no, it didn't. <laughs> is this a required vaccine uh, candidate yeah. for kids in this country? Yes. We, well, yeah. uh, well, we give IPV which, in the U S yeah. we give IPV. Yeah. But yes, you needed to go to school. Yeah. And so Daniel said that last night, he said, he has people in New York asking, I can't remember getting polio vaccine as a kid. He said, well, you had to, to go to school. In if New you York, went to, you know? yeah. But, yeah. And it's now, um, most kids are getting it as part of a combined vaccine. Um, so it's just like built into the, what it, what is it? The, um, DTAP. The theory of pertussis. Yeah. DTAP. Um, the uh, which of pertussis, now also includes acellular pertussis. That's the AP, right? And then this OPV is part of that. Yeah, OPV is part of, or well, IPV is part of that. IPV, yeah, yeah. it's all injected. So I don't know if it's going to keep circulating. I don't know if the uh, the OPV two is going to keep circulating. I think those are open the questions. Point, the yeah. other point that's being missed here is that this is a country of immigrants. People are coming from everywhere to live here. And uh, they're coming in large numbers from some places and small numbers from other places, mm -hmm. but they're still coming. So how are you going to justify giving us just the injectable rather than the NOPV? Because we need to be protected against strains of virus that come in and create carriers. Well, if you get the IPV, you are protected from disease. Not carriers, so you're not no, you're not protected from being a carrier. But if we have high levels of vaccination, um, say so we is unfortunately we is one thing. How about them? <laughs> well, no, no. The issue is um, what happened in Rockland County is vaccination levels fell to a level that, if somebody finally managed to get <clears throat> paralyzed by the circulating OPV uh, that was there, and the solution to that is for people to just get vaccinated. Yeah, with IPV. Yeah. It's a perfectly, uh, right. perfectly suitable approach. But um, the, the the rest of the world that's supplied vaccine by WHO gets OPV and now NLPV2. Yes. And that is clearly a threat to <laughs> IPV using nations. Although even OPV, look, if you finish your OPV course, within six months, your gut, uh, antibody levels are low. You're going to get infected. Yeah. Not going to prevent infection. But, right? keep saying this over and over but um the, the real issue in my view is surveillance we don't do wastewater surveillance to know yep. where it is and if we had we would have known that there's virus around and we could maybe we could have told people get immunized but i think for the future the, some of the questions we brought up is it going to keep circulating 
You don't know until you do wastewater sampling, unless you want to wait for a paralytic case to be your sentinel, which I don't think is a good idea. No, right? that's not a good no. plan. It's not a good plan. Nope. And it's a cheap, easy test too, right? Well, I, I think there's a, well, cheap and easier relative terms in, in public <laughs> health that has these roller coaster funding cycles going back for centuries. Yeah. Um, fortunately, right at the moment, there is a lot of interest in um, in monitoring sewage treatment plants and yep. and doing routine testing for viruses. Obviously, there's mm. one virus in particular that they've been doing this with. But once you're doing that, once you're taking the samples and doing PCR on them, you can piggyback assays for other viruses on that, <laughs> which is what New York State is doing now. And they're going back to samples that they took and archived. So... I'd love to see that expanded so that that becomes a standard part you bet. of um, you bet. just our our infrastructure. We monitor our sewage for a whole panel of viruses, and that's just something you do. Did we not do COVID nineteen this way in most cities in the U.S.? Eventually, yeah. No, eventually, we're yes. already doing it. Right. Yeah. Well, now we didn't. We didn't to start with. No. But no. We but I think now we're doing it. I think. Yeah. That's great. And we the, are doing it. There's the pig to go onto the back of. <laughs> Right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, this failure to do wastewater sampling is crazy because uh, I, I read a, um, a Lancet paper from 2017 where they were looking at persistence of OPV in, in, uh, in people. And they said basically... As population immunity declines, enhanced surveillance will be necessary for timely detection and response to unexpected type 2 transmission. And they're saying environmental surveillance is needed. 2017, and we're not doing it here in the U.S. And the only th I would argue not. the only reason we're doing it now is because it was done for SARS-CoV-2, right? Yeah. Right. So this group that yeah, we spoke the key, with- The key uh, is to keep the funding for those programs and not <laughs> say, oh, well, nothing's bad. Nothing bad has happened in the last uh, you know, half election cycle. That's so let's right, go ahead right, and move those right. funds into tax breaks for the, somebody. The two, the two twibs we had with the group from New York who, uh, uh, Monica Trujillo and uh, John Dennehy, Davida Smith, um, you know, we- we suggested last year to them to, to look for polio. So I emailed them a couple of weeks ago and they said, we're all doing it. We got primers. So, <laughs> so the well, we just got in, your email. <laughs> the, yeah. The Vita's in Texas. So she's looking, she said she just got permission to collect wastewater. So she's not going to have any archive stuff, but guy in Missouri, Mark Johnson says he has archived samples and they have here. They've already looked in New York. We know it's in New York city uh, wastewater. <clears throat> The um, trouble so, is that there's so much. I'm sorry. Go oh, and also, um, do you remember the lady we had from Colorado who was the first to detect uh, the alpha uh, variant? Emily Travanti. Emily Travanti. Was it Travanti? Something, Something like that. Something like that. So they're doing it as well. So we're going to see now in the coming weeks where it is. And if you go back to TWIVs before the pandemic, we had some where people did just these open-ended sewage surveys mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and looked, hey, what's the, what's the sewage virome? And the answer is, it's immense. It's I mean, huge. There's, it is huge. There's all sorts of stuff in there, <laughs> including the, the stuff that we, is, is we ought to be well tracking. Also. Yeah. I mean, um, estrogen disruptors. Sure, sure. Uh, forever chemicals, all these right. things. They have an impact on human existence yep. that uh, we have no data on whatsoever. We but have we no could. data. Very, it's, very it's sad. Just, we, as Alan said, it's politically uh, wrapped up, right? Because you don't get money to do this because the politicians say, no, we don't have to do this. So There's an antifungal, I'm going to block on the name, I think it's called atrazine, but I'm not sure, uh, which induces uh, teratogenic effects in amphibians. And the, the way you know that it's being used, illegally, of course, is to do surveys in frogs and see how many legs they have. That's absurd. Yeah, that's the, that's <laughs> the screening, that's how many the legs? That's oh, my the, gosh. They, well, they're supposed to have four. Oh, atrazine. <laughs> so is many this, of them uh, have three and some have five. Is this atrazine? Or atrazine. That's the one. Atrazine. atrazine. I believe it's atrazine. So it's apparently it can also for change males into female frogs. Fish. And there's the same for fish. But you look for the end result, you idiots. Why don't you just 
look in somebody's uh, barn. <laughs> so that so counting legs is like chemicals. is like asking how many people get paralyzed to surveil your yeah, exactly you know, exactly yeah. exactly. It's not exactly. the right it's not the right surveillance. It's, yes, right. Atrazine, it's, a, it's the wrong end of the colon a, to be looking at. Right. It's not. It's not a fungicide. It's an herbicide. Uh, right. Um, right. But that is. Uh, it's used that is still in, in the it's, Midwest. It's still widely used. It is yeah. not in Europe. Europe has right. banned the use. So, so our latest uh, herbicide is vinegar and detergent. That's a good okay. idea. It's like you, you make 5% vinegar and you just put a few squirts per gallon of dish detergent and you spray it on your whatever you don't want and within hours they're dead. <laughs> whatever you don't want. And right. then the next week Plant they're back. Lantern flies. And then the next week it's they're like, back. <laughs> it's like glyphosate and the lids not go there either. No, those yeah. things are very toxic, but this is not, I mean, vinegar, right? You just have to keep it, you keep applying it. You have to keep applying exactly. it until you exactly. get yeah. everything. Uh, you know, I've just, have done it many times in this morning. I see that it's, it's just laughing at me. It's growing back. Yeah. So imagine yourself as a commercial grower. No, and you're going you to pick the easiest way. thing you can possibly yeah. use and then use that yeah. and get a variance in your state legislature to allow you to use it because economically, uh, agriculture is a big driving force in a lot of states. But if you did it inside, indoors, Dixon, that wouldn't be an issue, right? You wouldn't have to use any of that. So why aren't we doing that, Dixon? Just to have a filter. It seems well, so obvious. You know, it's a, just in a amazing. word, money. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. But uh, you're seeing a lot of this activity in the mid in the uh, Middle East right now. Uh, a lot of vertical farms are being established. I mean, hundreds. It's amazing. What about here in the U.S.? Uh, less than hundreds, but I think the rate is going up for sure. And okay. uh, it's because of all this horrible drought that we're having, mostly. Mm-hmm. Right. Iowa was going to be a barren state. They're, they're going to not be able to collect any uh, corn from Iowa this year. And I've seen the wheat crops go like that, too, several years ago. So nobody's looking the way they should look, I think. They're, they're trying to divert the Mississippi River to California to make up for the loss of Colorado River flow. <laughs> I don't get it. This is, this is science fiction at this point. It's just maddening. Every 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 problem presents eighteen different solutions, none of which are viable. All right, sorry, I, I it was my fault that he, that he got no, into that because I, I mentioned. I haven't <laughs> read it in less than a week. I, I, I needed that. All right, we have another paper. We're going to switch viruses. We're going to switch to influenza virus. And um, I was thinking uh, on the way in this this is actually a paper we we should do on immune, but I, I'm yes. really interested <laughs> because. It, it, we're interested in um, broadly protective influenza vaccines, and this tells us some very important information about those. So the paper is in Immunity. The title is Allelic Polymorphism Controls Autoreactivity and Vaccine Elicitation of Human Broadly Neutralizing Antibodies Against Influenza Virus. And we have uh, the first author is Maya Sangasland, and... Uh, the last author is Daniel Lingwood, and this is a group from MIT, from the Scripps at La Jolla, from uh, the Vaccine Research Center, which is at NIH, and Bristol-Myers Squibb. So uh, and many people are trying to make broadly neutralizing uh, vaccines that induce broadly neutralizing antibodies against influenza virus, right? Uh, so that you don't have to vaccinate every year. And we, so you could get one flu shot when you're a kid and never have to get a flu shot again. Or as be great. Tony Fauci said, maybe one every 10 years would be good, yeah. you know. But, uh, and we've had a few people on to talk about those. Uh, but this paper addresses a very interesting mechanism. And, and essentially these, most of the antibodies that people are thinking about are directed against the spike protein of influenza rice, the hemagglutinin, right? And the hemagglutinin has a, a globular head that binds the receptor, and it has a stalk. And the the broadly neutralizing epitopes are on the stalk, they're not on the head. But the stalk is immunosubdominant. Most people don't make a lot of antibodies against the stalk. The head is immunodominant. It's yeah. So a, a, a virus like poliovirus, it's got three serotypes, and that's all, and it's not making any more. So the antibodies that you generate, yeah. 
to those three serotypes will protect you from all polioviruses that will exist. Um, a number of viruses, including influenza and notoriously HIV, um, the immune system's initial response is to the wrong thing. It's to something that's highly variable. It's like the virus comes in wearing a hat and it responds to the hat and then it comes in wearing a different hat. And it doesn't recognize it. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think that that's one thing that people sometimes forget when they're thinking about immune responses to an antigen um, like HA or definitely to an entire microbe is that there are lots of different parts of that antigen or microbe that can um, elicit a response, lots of different epitopes. And it turns out that all of those epitopes don't lead to the same size response. Some are dominant over others, yeah. um, as Vincent pointed out. And I think the one thing that's important for this paper to realize about that immunodominance, um, we don't understand all of the reasons why immunodominance happens, um, but in some ways it's about um, competition among the B cells that are making the antibodies. Mm -hmm. So you might have B cells that respond to five different epitopes and one of those B cells making one particular type of antibody is going to win in competition. That might be competition for antigen or other growth factors or T cell help or whatever. And so one B cell is going to, um, I like the word expand. They like to use amplify um, in the <laughs> paper. Uh, like I said, I, I tend to use the word expand on this, but the idea is this one B cell and its progeny are going to outcompete the others. Um, and that is what leads to this dominant epitope. And so when you immunize with stock, that um, or HA that includes both head and stock, um, there are some B cells recognizing stock, there are some B cells recognizing head, and the ones that recognize head win. They outcompete the ones that recognize stock. And so what they're trying to do in this paper is trying to figure out, well, what's the biology of those B cells trying to make antibodies against stock, why are they maybe not competitive? And how can we maybe think about that in the future? So, Brian, yeah. in the old days, we used to use the word avidity. And uh, are we not using that word any longer? <laughs> um, so avidity could be one part of immunodomination, um, but it's not necessarily the only part. That's a, that sounds like a name for a video game, immunodomination. <laughs> immunodomination, yeah, yes. that Immunodomination was the word that we always used in graduate school when we were talking about this. Um, and that's not a word that the field seems to use as frequently anymore. But there were lots of times reading this where I was like, the word you want is immunodomination. <laughs> so the reason that the, the globular head being immunodominant is a problem is because that's the variable part, right? The stem yeah. is pretty yeah. conserved. But the head changes and you have to change the vaccine. So if we could somehow get antibodies directed against the stem, and that's, as Brian said, that's what they're trying to figure out in this paper. And tantalizingly, there are, there are instances and situations and maybe even people who develop yeah. antibodies, broadly neutralizing anti-influenza antibodies against the stalk. And mm -hmm. that does, doesn't happen reliably. So how can we... Get that yeah, we want to know how could you right. how could you design a vaccine to get those antibodies to be dominant right. when they're we, subdominant. Yeah. We know right? it's possible. We know it can happen. Yeah, because we have got <laughs> those many, antibodies. Uh, Vincent, how many proteins are in the head? Just one. The, the HA is a trimer of a single polypeptide. So, what happens in vitro if you were to eliminate that? It's not so, necessary in vitro, and then use that virus. Well, to that's one. It. That's one of the things they're doing is to make headless yeah. um, immunogens. Is that but, a dumb thing to think about? Or no, no, that's exactly no. what they do that's here. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, Get it's been done. The head and the body will follow. They, they, say they have made, boxing all the time. <laughs> they have made. They have made headless immunogens, but yeah. uh, in this paper, you would like to understand yeah. why it is subdominant and and. That leads to other ways that you can right. get around the issue. And, and I see fact, Alan drooling over all the titles for the shows we could have yeah. if that actually <laughs> happens. And, and, and Dixon, part of the part of the point of this paper is also them trying to realize or trying to understand why doesn't that always work? Right. right. Um, because it works sometimes, and they have some data that they talk about in the intro about why they think it should work much of the time, but it so, doesn't. 
And so, so the they're trying to figure out why. the polymorphism in the host governs whether or not a dominant or non-immunodominant epitope will actually stimulate the so right kind of immunity. So that's kind of what they're, we're talking about here. Right. Um, so a few people don't catch AIDS no matter what, right? Um, <laughs> so it ends up being a little different than that, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying that yeah. every time you look for exceptions, you're going to find them. <laughs> oh, yes, that is very true. So, yeah, so you'll the, find, um, yeah, okay. we have to talk a little bit about antibodies here so that you'll understand yeah. the results. And um, as, as you may know, the, the antibody protein, it's, it's a tetramer for polypeptides, two heavy and two light chains. And there, there are regions uh, of, the, of the polypeptides that are variable or hypervariable, and those are the parts that combine uh, with with antigen, and they're called complementary determining regions, or CDRs. And there's hypervariable regions, and then there are variable regions. And I presume, Brian, the hypervariables are that's where somatic hypermutation kicks in. Um. It can, but that's actually not the key thing for mm -hmm. this paper. The somatic hypermutation is not as important for this no, paper. No, no, but I'm just asking in general, yeah. is a hypervariable part of an antibody, is it hypervariable because of SHM or not necessarily? No, it's hypervariable even before SHM. Okay, because the, these are the variable regions are genomically encoded. They're hardwired. They're public well, uh, sequences, yeah. right? So, yes. so yeah. So here's so I, here's a way that I'll think about this. And if what I explain doesn't make sense, I even found my slides from last fall. <laughs> yeah. uh, if you wouldn't want need to see a picture, um, so both the heavy chain and the light chain have three hypervariable regions, mm -hmm. otherwise known as CDRs, and those are the most variable parts of antibody proteins. If you were to align those proteins together. If you look at the structure of the heavy chain and the light chain, you can imagine your heavy chain and your light chain are sort of getting ready to bind to the antigen. And they each have three little fingers, three little loops at the end that are coming out to touch the antigen. And that is actually HVR one, two, and three. Okay. You've got some okay. three on the heavy chain, three on the light chain. HVR three or CDR three is the one that people focus on a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, that one, number three, is made based on the new junction that comes in with the V, D, and J and the base pairs you add. So all of the cutting and pasting and all of that interesting nucleic acid work, that goes to giving you a very a really unique CDR3. Mm -hmm. But if you look at CDRs1 and CDR2, those are actually just parts of the sequence of the variable region. Um, so if I have used variable region 56, that by definition includes a particular HVR1 and a particular HVR2. And then the HVR3 of that antibody comes from the combinations and the additions and subtractions of base pairs that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we um, save them, right? Uh, we do save them, but the the thing that they talk about a lot in this paper is that the um, the parts of the antibody that are making contact with the stalk. So the the part of the antibody that contacts the stalk here is part of um, the CDR two or HVR two. Mm -hmm. That's right. one that, right. that is part of the normal genetics of the V region. It has nothing to do with VDJ recombination. Right now, your V169 already has it. You don't have to do any somatic hypermutation. You don't have to do any VDJ recombination. Right. Whichever B cells in your body just happen to pick that V region already have the perfect HVR to bind to stock. So that's what's called a public... Right. So that's what's called a public because everybody right. has it and you don't have to do anything special to get it. Okay. Right. And so um, the key is this process of selecting which B cells are going to respond because you have the ability to make this antibody that responds to the stalk. It's in there, but most of the time you get a response that's against the head. And then in a minority of cases, you get this, what they call the immunodistracted response, where for some reason you don't get the head response growing out right away and you get this other alternative antigen Stem. response. You get the head, is, but not the stem. So what if which you, is actually what you want. 
Yes. <laughs> right. So what if you gave an infected person a monoclonal antibody against the head to block those antibodies and leave the stalk available There's a better for reactivity. way. There's a better way. We're going to find out. Yeah. There's a better ah. way. And you may relate yeah. to what they actually do, Dixon. So hang on, okay? Can I'm you, hanging, can you I'm hang hanging. on? So this immunodistracting <laughs> is very yes. interesting because they say here, you know, w one of the reasons for subdominance is that you have th these antibodies that are targeting these low frequency conserved sites in the stalk. They can't compete in the germinal center, as Brienne said, with the other antibodies. So these other antibodies, these immunodistracted targeting other sites, dominate affinity maturation, like the head, right? So immunodistraction yeah, is, is an interesting context. So this, this idea of these public um, sequences that are in everyone ready to go, as Brienne said, they said, and the, they say here, we think we can exploit those and bring them out in some vaccine, uh, some rationally designed immunogen is the way they put it, right? And this paper addresses, you know, whether that's in fact possible uh, to do that. So a little bit about influenza virus uh, that's important for this. So um, the, the HA diversity falls within two types, groups one and two, okay? And so you can make... Um, you, you can make antibodies that will hit all of group one and, and all of group two. Uh, and the stalk region is relatively uh, invariant. And that's where either the group one or the group two uh, antibodies can bind. And these are broadly neutralizing antibodies or BNABs is what we may use to term, to, to uh, describe them. Um, now, we humans do have these public responses f for, or they encode antibodies that will hit the stalk. We know this from previous work, particularly for group one hemagglutinins. And, uh, and as Brian said, these come from a CDHR2 contact, right? Coming mm -hmm. um, from a specific VH gene, IGHV1-69. So a specific yep. uh, gene encoding a specific public antibody can hit the stalk of a group one influenza A virus. And you can... Yep. Take uh, you can take this gene and put it in transgenic mice, um, and they will endow the mice with the ability to make antibodies that recognize this conserved epitope. Right? Yeah. So, so basically, you're taking away all of the other V regions except for um, this V region, so that when the B cells are developing, they have to pick this one. There are no other choices, and so you're kind of biasing the mouse's um, B cells towards making um, B right. cells that are going to bind to stock. So they say that um, this particular uh, VH gene endows the mice with the ability to make B cells that make antibodies that can bind this conserved epitope when you give them the right immunogen. But they say if you give them an immunodistracting immunogen like a HA with the head, then it doesn't work. So they say the BNAB response can't be amplified and that's the, the word that Brianne doesn't like in, in these so animals. Alan, when, mice uh, are, are indeed easily distracted. When yes. uh, the <laughs> immunodistractive features of the HA, namely the, the globular head, were incorporated into the immunogen. Okay. Yes. Um, so this particular gene, IGHV1-69, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is polymorphic in people. It's variable. And in particular, yeah. there is a very specific residue um, position 54 within CDHR2. It's one of these loop residues that Rian talked about that contacts the HA stalk. And people either have a phenylalanine or a leucine encoded in that particular uh, antibody. Um, mo most people have phenylalanine at 54, but there are some people that have uh, um, leucine at that position. And in fact, uh, well, rem thirteen yeah. percent of the. Sorry, go ahead, um, Kathy. Kathy, Kathy. You were gonna. Uh, you have to remember that people are diploid, so yes. most of the people will have either an L, a leucine, leucine, or a leucine phenylalanine. Right. Or, or, and I said that wrong. Though most of them will have the the phenylalanine, phenylalanine, or phenylalanine leucine. Leucine, right? And right. I it's, think it's as 13 I was thirteen percent have leucine, leucine. Yeah. Right. right. And as I was reading through, the way I remembered it was that 
L is for loser. <laughs> right. Yes. I, I actually remembered I it with the F, it. Right. but not in the right way. <laughs> All right. So the first thing they do in this paper is to look through the thousand genomes project, right? Genomes of a thousand people and ask, what do we see at this position 54 of this particular uh, IGHV-69 gene? And they find um, uh, F5454, the homozygous, as Kathy said, um, their skewing of usage uh, across various populations, except for South Asian populations, which have a distinct preference for L54, L54. Yeah. And one other thing that they point out um, before they get into that part is that when they actually go and look at the broadly neutralizing antibodies to stock that had been characterized before this, mm -hmm. they always included the F54. They never included, were very, very rarely included the L54. Okay. So it seemed like there was something up with L54 versus S, uh, F54. And actually, Vincent, I went back to the previous paper, the AVNIR mm. 2016. Right. Because I wanted yes. to know that. And um, it's not just the Asians that have 15% LL. Europeans have 19, it's 19% LL. Yeah. Okay. So it's just that African is really low for the LL and combined. Yeah. So they, they say including Asians. Yeah. But they don't. Yeah. Right. Mention and it and here, a, yeah. an obvious reason why these might vary regionally like that is that through human evolutionary history, um, we've had different epidemics in different places at different times. And whatever bottleneck a population went through is going to skew what kinds of alleles they have at these different positions. And it's important to emphasize that um, we're going to talk a lot about how this affects your response to flu. But having one of these that's not as good at responding to flu almost certainly makes you much better at responding to something else. So mm -hmm. the, the idea, the, and the whole reason this variability exists in the population, the reason you have this diversity is so that when some new pathogen mm -hmm. comes along and afflicts your tribe, odds are somebody's going to survive. And so you want these things mixed around. So basically in, in this paper, what they're looking at is, we know that both L54 and F54 exist in people. They want to know if L54 carriers can respond and make broadly neutralizing antibodies against influenza virus. Because if they can't, that's a problem, right? Because and, and if not, why not? If not, why not? <laughs> yeah. And maybe figure out a way to do it, which they get to a little bit. But, uh, you know, this is a really important issue, right? One vaccine may not fit everybody, even though that's the way we've been brought up so far, right? Most of our vaccines, everybody gets the same uh, vaccine. But as you are moving into trying to target specific parts, like conserved parts, then you, it's not one vaccine fits all. It's cool. So the first <laughs> set of experiments is they, they have um, two L54 BNABs. Right, which Brian said they haven't studied much before. He studied the F. And I just wanted to tell Dixon, because he will appreciate that. They're talking about the different residues of the uh, antibody, and they talk about Cabot positions 98 to 100. <laughs> and I knew you, that would resonate, because you knew Alvin, right, Dixon? I did. I knew him very well. So uh, yeah. Cabot, Alvin Cabot, an immunologist at Columbia, who I knew also, uh, he was the first to compare all these antibody sequences. Exactly. Before we had he genome had sequences, you just had protein sequences like and he had books that he would publish where they just That's line right. them up and start to get some insight about, you so know. No gen bank in those days. <laughs> and, and I remember him as the grouchy old man, one of the two grouchy old men who would come to microbiology seminar every Friday. He oh, and Harry Ginsburg. Was, Actually, Harry was not as grouchy, but Elvin no, always no, no, struck no. me. Elvin was um, curmudgeon. Yeah. Definitely yes. curmudgeon. But Dixon, you said he was a mensch. I loved him. He was a great man. We had many, many individual talks because I got there early a lot of times and so did he. And one time he got there even earlier than I did. And as I walked in, he says, in his inimitable way, and I can actually do a good Elvin Cabot imitation. Young man, come over here for a minute. I want to show you something. So 
<laughs> I said, sure. <laughs> and he reaches into his uh, briefcase and he pulls out a box and he opens it up. He says, I was just awarded the uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, Award for the best scientist this year. I just thought you'd like to know. <laughs> and he closes it up, puts it back in his suitcase and goes on. I, it was the... the it's such, it's such an accent. It's such an accent. It was well, incredible. That is a pitch perfect Elvin Cabot. I yeah, Elvin and I spent a lot of time together. And unfortunately, he develops Alzheimer's disease and uh, sold, slowly faded away. Yeah. Well, he left yeah. Columbia. He went down to the NIH for a number of years because I think his collaborator was down there. But he yeah, always he carried a highly... he always carried a face mask in a little. Uh, oh, bad, he, he had was such, allergic to smoke. He had such allergies. Because oh, yeah. when he used no, to just cigarette smoke was his nemesis. When he used to teach medical students, <clears throat> he used to inject himself every year with the same antigen, and he claims he developed incredible auto reactivity. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and right. he was Bloody. allergic to many things. And I remember I went on a job interview uh, when I was looking at Columbia, and he came to dinner with me. And he sat next to me and he showed me this little bag with his face mask. And he said, I have oh, to yeah, wear this yeah. because I injected That's myself right. so many years. That's right. It was so That's funny. Right. Well, anyway. They used to allow smoking on airplanes, So right? Cabot positions, because so, yeah. he originally lined up the positions on the conserved and variable yeah, regions. Yeah, yeah. And they there was them. another guy, Cabot and Wu. This yeah, Wu was his collaborator, yeah. Anyway, right. they, they, they have two L-54 stock BNABs. Okay, from different people. So they've pulled out B cells from people. They've cloned out the antibodies, and they found them some that are directed against the stalk, and they can sequence them and see that these are L54, right? And they bind the stalk. They both work. And, and they they bind the stalk. They bind the stalk using relatively similar amino acids, right. similar angles. So it's not like the reason why you you know you may not see too many of these um, is because the they can't bind no, or they can't they recognize. absolutely bind. Yeah. So right. so the antibody recognition exists in these people. Yep. So 40, 20 to forty thousand people a year die in this country from what they would call influenza, but it's probably a combination of other respiratory diseases, but mainly from influenza. Why can't they develop a monoclonal antibody? against the stalk, and that's a survival mechanism now? Wouldn't that work? Well, if you can't, if those B cells can't survive. No, 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 work. you're going to inject this, just like you, you wanna, inject you from give the them antivirals. Monoclonal. Um, you know, yeah. I think that my question first would be about timing of when you'd administer that and whether well, you could get it to the patients at the right timing. You have to give it, before in, they're dying, you have before to give they're it within dying 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. It's a really narrow window. It's hard. But I, I think it that. does save a lot of lives, Dixon. All right. Yeah. Okay. So we have these two uh, L54. They both bind just like F54 does pretty much. That's what yep. the structure tells us. Okay. So then we go to mice. They make transgenic mice with a human uh, HC2 locus, which basically will restrict all their antibodies to single VH genes. But then you can still get diversity in the hypervariable loops. And so what they did is they restricted them to germline sequences of uh, IGHV69, F54 or L54, right? The two alleles in these mice. Um, and then they, they make these mice and they show that they make uh, antibodies that uh, mirror the, um, the human uh, CDHR3. Yep. And the, the big thing here is that they actually use um, the antigen Dixon was asking questions about earlier, um, but they use it to detect B cells. In this case, they're right. going to use right. it as an immunogen in right. figure three. But right now they're just using it to detect B cells. So they've shown that the reactivity can exist um, in figure one. And now they're showing that the B cells that make those antibodies exist. Right. Um, so for immunology aficionados, um, this figure is looking at precursor frequency um, of those B cells. So can you make a B cell that comes out of your bone marrow that recognizes this antigen? We're not looking at sort of the out-competing part yet. We're just, can you make that B cell um, with the L54 versus the S54? So they're using, as you said, these nanoparticles decorated with the uh, stalk or stalk plus yep. head just as a control. Right. And to, uh, to find the B to cells, find that right? The B cell, yeah. yeah. Um, and they find, oh my gosh, you can make either 
of these types of B cells. Right. The both B cells exist. And in fact, they even do the ex a little bit with what uh, Dixon was asking, and they even show that they have similar affinity. Um, and they make some points about why they don't talk about affinity. But in this case, they just talk about affinity. And they, they have um, the different combinations of L, L and F, the homozygous and, mm -hmm. and heterozygous, um, which they can then look at. So they could, they made uh, homozygous for both and heterozygous, and they can look at the frequency of antibodies that are made that bind uh, the stalk uh, of the um, of the HA. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, F fifty four, you get germ, you get antibodies that bind uh, the stalk. Um, uh, L L fifty four. Um, Wait a minute. Uh, yeah, in L54, L54, um, on-target BCRs are elevated relative to F54. And in the yeah, heterozygotes... so you get plenty of them. And in, in heterozygotes, um, so these are, they're looking at the actual B cells that are bearing the BCR, right? And in yeah. heterozygotes... And just, do they exist? Do they Not exist? have they expanded? No, no expansion, no antibodies yet, just secreted, yeah. And in the heterozygotes, the frequency and number of the B cells is diluted as you would expect because you have half the gene number in, in a heterozygote, right? Okay, so then let's look at amplification leading to the production of uh, BNABs. So they vaccinate these, these transgenic mice. Again, they have very specific VH regions in them. Uh, they, they vaccinate them with their nanoparticles uh, that have uh, a stalk attached to them. So these are like multivalent particles with lots of copies of, uh, of stalk on them. And they sequentially vaccinate their mice, which they have shown previously amplifies uh, the, this, the protective response in F54 homozygous animals, but not in um, their, their control mice. So... Um, Although homozygous F54 mice amplify antibodies that target the BNAB epitope, the L54 homozygotes were unable to do so. They could not make antibodies that would target this conserved site uh, on the stalk. And stalk. But if you use a heterozygote, they're better at making those antibodies. So they say one copy of F54 can rescue this messed up response in the L54 um, mice. Yeah. So we know the B cell receptor combined. We know the B cells exist, but somehow those B cells that exist and can bind aren't getting expanded right. to make antibodies. They also so do some neutralization assays, right? So that's good because they just take it one step further, not just binding. They have the sera from the F54 homozygotes uh, can neutralize the uh, virus matched to the immunogen, they can neutralize a virus that's not matched to the immunogen within various subtypes and even unmatched avian viruses. Can, it's a broadly neutralizing antibody. It's very cool. Um, but the more L54 you have, you get less and less neutralization across different kinds of influenza viruses. Uh, but the antibodies, they have equivalent titers of stalk antibodies. That's the thing. They make stalk antibodies, but they're not the broadly neutralizing ones, apparently. And they even did a challenge with lethal, a lethal challenge study with H5N1, H, highly pathogenic H5N1 avian influenza virus. Um, and the F54 containing mice are protected. The L54 are not. It's a pretty nice uh, series. Okay, so what is going on here? Now we get into some uh, mechanisms, and they they ask, um, do these mice make antibodies against their cell themselves, autoantigens, right? Yeah. So maybe one reason why the B cells can't expand is because they uh, developed in such a way that they're not allowed to expand. Maybe because right. they were autoreactive during right. So that's a that's our understanding is if you make an autoreactive B cell, it gets wiped out, right? Because you don't want those proliferating or amplifying or what is the word you used? I was using expanding. Expanding, yeah. Um, but you basically, if you make an autoreactive B cell, you have to do something about it. There are a few <laughs> different ways you can do right. something about Although, it. Although um, one of them is make it so the cell can't 
expand. Expand. <laughs> of course, there, was, there are some people who do make them because they have issues in getting rid of those B cells, right? Yeah. Exactly. And anyway, they find that the L54 monoclonals are more polyreactive than F54 antibodies. They react with a variety of self. They get they go through a variety of uh, different kinds of molecules. So that's quite uh, interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting, kind of from a vaccine development. Oh, that's why we can't get this vaccine yeah, yeah. to work quite the way we want. And it's also kind of interesting from an autoimmunity thing of, oh, if you have this allele, perhaps you are uh, have different susceptibility towards autoimmune disease. And that's not something they think about here. But yeah. you could imagine somebody in the future could think about that. How does that pan out, though, when you go and look epidemiologically in the regions that have LLs I, for mm, autoimmune diseases? That's a good question. I yeah, I don't think they've looked at no. any of that, but that's certainly something you could do after that. But they did get antibodies right, yeah. from people, um, F54, L54, and they show the same poly autoreactivity as in the uh -huh. mice, because you could argue, yeah. ah, the mice, you know, they're mice, but it happens in people apparently as well. But evolutionarily, you can imagine um, the whole point of this system is to explore all the possible antigenic space that right. could exist. Um and to prevent exploring or, or amplifying or expanding uh, anything that comes out that responds to self, which is a chunk of the antigenic space. So here's the no-go zone. Um, and then, you know, we've got all these different alleles kicking around in the population. And, and as I pointed out earlier, this is so that somebody in your tribe will survive when the new virus comes along. Um, why can't we all just have all that diversity? And the answer is, well... You got to stay out of that no-go zone so you can approach it from different directions. Maybe if you approach it from over here, you've got to stay further away and you approach it from over here, you know, and so these are going to shift all around this. And I think what we're seeing here is that we're influenza virus places a very specific constraint on things with the, the hat, you know, the head that's disguising it and, and everybody responds to that. You want to respond to the stalk, which is a very specific thing you need to respond to. And if you're trying to avoid your self-response because your particular alleles are over here, then you can't get close enough to that stalk response that you yeah. need. Yeah, I mean, I think to me, I, I really liked the idea that you know, we often talk about, well, we're going to make these universal influenza vaccines by just targeting the stalk. And yeah. Easy, done. We have to figure out some biochemistry of making that stock. But once we do that, it's going to be all set. Right. And this It'll is all be showing, done by 1979. Yeah. yeah. And this is showing <laughs> us another complication on top of that. That's why yeah. I like this because it tells you the host matters, right? And you yes. have to take that into consideration, which, yeah. Well, that re we reminds didn't. me of the fact that in 1918... In 1919, when the big influenza epidemic was going on, it targeted young people and old people, but not in between people. So what's going on there? That's a good question. We don't know. And it may be related to previous exposure in different age groups of a related influenza virus. But since it's right, so right. long ago, right. we really don't have any way of right. uh, looking at that. Okay. I, th I think, Dixon, you may have said it. Or, I heard it wrong, yeah. But I think you said it backwards. In a I typical did? influenza in, uh, uh It targets outbreak, the very young and the very targets, old, right? Right. And this one gave us the W-shaped curve because yeah, yeah, there was yeah, 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 the, yeah, people, right. the population right. in the middle right. that it did affect. Right. All right. So we so these this uh, L54 uh, encoded antibodies, they, they're poly autoreactive. So what's the consequence of that? They look through... Uh, the, the different stages of B-cell development, bone marrow, uh, B-cells in the periphery, et cetera. And they find similar amounts in L54 or F54 uh, animals. But what they then find is that the, um, the, F, the L54 uh, B-cells are never able to accumulate in the germinal centers uh, of the lymph nodes. Is that, that's correct, right, uh, Brianne? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned that you, when you have an autoreactive B cell that um, is generated during development, you have to do something about it. Um, and usually we, t when I 
teach this. I teach that there are, you know, three different paths of which, which way you could do something about it. Um, one of which is called energy. And here what they kind of look at is checking, did those B cells actually go through the energy pathway like we suspected? And they check all sorts of different parts about the development of those B cells. And in fact, they look like energic B cells. And in fact, I learned some things about energic B cells in uh, looking at this, um, where the basic idea is that those cells, if they do get triggered to to start to expand, they can't really persist very well. They can't really make memory cells very well. Mm -hmm. um, right. That's the other thing. They can't make memory cells as a consequence. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, because they were kind of pushed along this energy pathway when they developed. What's the basis for energy? What, uh, the basis for energy in sort of the classical sense yeah. <laughs> is um, binding to self with a particular kind of um, medium uh, signaling strength in the bone marrow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I think I have to go to the men's room. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so energy is this kind of. It's like they're sent to limbo, right? Yeah. I mean, oh, they're not okay. killed. Sorry. They're yeah. energy is sort of like you take the cell and you permanently turn it off. So right. you don't kill the cell, you keep it around, but the cell can't do much. It's you're sort of keeping it around for. Um, Perhaps if there's an emergency um, that, and there's you know, lots of cytokine storm, maybe that cell will get turned back on and be useful. Yeah. Um, but the cell is, for all intents and purposes in normal immune responses, that cell is turned off. So it's basically the immune system said, you know, you've got an interesting idea <laughs> and we'd like to not explore that. It's so not you very go practical. sit over there. <laughs> just, yeah. just, <laughs> sit don't over call there, us, don't we'll die. call you. We, right, don't we're die. We're not going to kill you. Well, but we're right. just going to say sit over there that's and don't right, do that. That's right. And be quiet for God's sakes. Be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> so they actually, they do an experiment to actually show that you don't get memory cells. If you boost uh, these mice, these L54, L54 mice, you don't get a memory response, which is consistent with what we've just said about this, the energy uh -huh. and so forth. Yeah. Sorry, sorry if I didn't understand your energy question, Dixon. <laughs> so the last experiment is all about redemption. Clone, I just love this. <laughs> this is like a religious oh. revival show, not a <laughs> show about viruses and immunity. Right, Come I mean, on, you've got original <laughs> antigenic sin. Know, there I must know, be I redemption, know. right? You know, so. we should really change the terminology. This is clonal otherwise. redemption. So they look at the structures <laughs> of, take us off the, air. of the uh, antibodies <laughs> bound to the stalk for the L and the F. And they say, you know, there should be some, some uh, we could make some changes in this region. There could be amino acid changes uh, that would allow... Uh, Clonal redemption, right? Pull, basically, not go down this energy pathway. Uh, yeah. So, so you could find there are some are some amino acids that are involved in stock binding and making you a good stock binder, but that are not involved in making you a polyreactive binder. Right. Uncoupling the stock binding from being polyreactive, right? Yeah. And so they make so, they introduce some changes based on the structure, and they find that certain changes abolish autoreactivity, um, but doesn't abolish um, Stock binding. So, yeah, so they can kind of find the amino acids that might be involved in one versus the other. Now, that's so Alan, not so useful practically, right, Brian? Because you can't engineer people. Yeah, so I guess you'd have to then try to figure out um, how could you get an immunogen that hits one and not the other. Yeah. And I do not know the answer to that question at all, but I think that's where this would, would go. Yeah, where but it's interesting it that go. you can uncouple the two. So, yep. and then the last experiment says, can we use a drug to get around this issue? So they have an antibody to to a regulatory protein called CTLA four, uh, which uh, Brian tell us what that antibody would be doing. So. CTLA-4, uh, the antibody against CTLA-4 might stop parts of the energy process. Got it. Right. It might mess with the energy. Yeah, they call it dampening immune tolerance. Um, so they treat the mice um, and they find that this treatment with this antibody, this is one of the, is this one of the checkpoint inhibitors? It is one of the checkpoint okay. inhibitors. Um, and they say this treatment restores the boosting of 
secondary L54 antibody responses against the stalk. So in other words, it, it gets it limits the energy. So now you've got some memory cells that have L54 antibodies that can recognize the stalk. So now, now that 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 one we said to sit over there and be quiet, yeah. it's to participate. You can participate <laughs> yes. now in the because we're giving them some drugs. So I, I thought you would appreciate that immunoregulatory antibody, Dixon. So it could be that you can in populations that are L50, so this is very complicated now, right? In populations that are yeah. L54 homozygous, you could couple the vaccine with CTLA4 antibody or something else. Right. So so what we'd be looking at here is um, this field of personalized medicine, which is usually done for things like uh, cancer or, or rare genetic diseases where you sequence somebody's genome or you sequence a particular gene. And if they're over here, then you give them this treatment or you customize it in some cases down to the individual level. Um, this might be a case where you, you sequence somebody's, you know, locus and see if they're L or F at that location. And then they get one vaccine or the other based on, um, or, or maybe three different vaccines, you know, the, the homozygotes get two different ones and the heterozygotes get a third. Just yeah. as a possibility. Yeah. So that's that's the story. So you have, you can induce these BNABs, but not in everybody. And the reason is because in people with the L54, L54 encoding, they... Um, their their B cells recognize themselves, so they're they're put in another room and they're not allowed to proliferate. So they say the inability to pathway amplify BNABs through L54 may hold significance for certain ethnicities with elevated L54 homozygosities. Um, uh, so they say uh, maybe we can somehow tune this in some way. But you know you have to wonder why they have. L54 homozygous. I think we may have mentioned this already. Maybe something else selected for it, right? Some other yeah, pathogen. I'm sure. I'm sure right. there's some other pathogen that uh, that these people are uniquely positioned to respond well to, and the downside is they don't respond yeah, as well to right. you know anyway. universal immunity to flu. So that's why I thought it was cool because it's getting beyond just one one vaccine fits all. But now we have to tailor if we're going to try and make these broadly neutralizing antibodies and that's just one example of something you may want to induce you have to start considering uh, the, the the genome of the people in particular and i think that's really yeah. a big sea change yeah i think know? this to me i really like how this highlights that it's hard and why it hasn't been something we've been able to do right away yeah yeah right okay I tell you, I learned a lot there. That was good. Yeah. Let's read a couple of emails. Uh, Kathy, can you take that first one? Yes. Kristen writes, Hello, TWIV team. I'm really glad that you had Andy Slavitt on recently, as I think his work at the interface of science, public health, and communication is also one with deep resonance for the TWIV community. It was really interesting to hear the hosts and guests discuss the challenges of finding solutions to problems when people in our society have so many different streams of information, backgrounds, and experiences. One thing that I would ask you to reflect on is a comment made at about the 16-minute mark of the podcast. That comment was about how academicians work in a bubble and that you rarely see this kind of behavior at schools worth going to. This comment was made directly after a comment that you have to treat everyone equally. I'm not sure actually, I'm not sure exactly what was meant by these comments, but they stood out to me and I'm sure to others listening in. As you can see from my email address and my signature below, I work at a school that many people in academia might not be that impressed by. It is a regional state school. I actively chose to work here because I love it and I think it's important. At work, I see students from every possible background, from affluent white kids who are the descendants from early colonial America to recent immigrants from all over the world who are working multiple jobs to support their families and education. In my bubble, I see all the different challenges that Andy Slavitt was talking about just before the moment I mentioned. I see the working mom trying to homeschool her kids while also complete her classes. I see the students whose life is in crisis because people at home had either lost their jobs or gotten sick with COVID or perhaps both. In fall 2020, I had a student who attended Zoom classes from his hospital room when he was hospitalized for COVID because he said it helped him think about something else. 
My students have gone on to MA and PhD programs and into medical physician's assistant and nursing schools. They have also gone on to work for biotech companies like the Thermo Fisher Scientific and Moderna. They work in academic labs such as the Broad Institute and Mass General Brigham. Many have gone from poverty to a middle-class life while also supporting the scientific advances that allowed us to develop things like the mRNA vaccines. My school is a school worth going to. Students get an excellent education for a more reasonable and affordable price. My students don't all need to be treated equally to each other or to students at other schools or people at other points in life. They need to be treated fairly, as all people do, acknowledging that different people need different things, whether that's different information, different supports, different understanding. We definitely don't all need to be treated equally, but we do need to treat each other fairly. This is long. I hope no one has to read it on the air, and it <laughs> certainly isn't my now intent you for <laughs> you to do so. My intent with this email is to alert you that the message I received from that moment in your podcast went completely against the message you were attempting to send. I hope that this message helps you see that. And if you are ever in the area and interested in exploring this bubble here at Salem State, I would be very happy to welcome you and host you. I continue to be very grateful for your work communicating science, as well as all of your scientific work moving knowledge forward, both of which help create a better world for all of us. And the hosts were right that the audience listening to TWIV throughout 2020 knew that the vaccines likely wouldn't produce sterilized immunity. So you can tell Andy's glad about that. <laughs> My best to all of you, Kristen. And um, has already revealed that um, she's at Salem State University. Yes. Kristen, thank you for that. Um, I wholeheartedly agree um, that all schools are schools worth going to. And uh, I'm you glad bet. that you made this uh, point for us. As a graduate of a state, uh, a regional state university um, myself, I, I totally on board with this. Yes, thank totally. You. Uh, in fact, I can attest to the fact that this is not one of your ordinary state universities either. I had the privilege of giving a talk there once on the uh, possible cause of death for Charles Darwin. And it was on Darwin Week in which the entire school has to go to these lectures and they are given tickets and they should end up with no tickets in their hand at the end of the week. These include English majors, history majors, and of course, biology and chemistry and physics majors. And everybody attended most of the lectures and they found them interesting and stimulating and everything else. And I was really impressed with the fact that here's a university that I had barely heard of uh, that I always thought well of after I had left because of their concern for the lack of um, systemic science education at every level of education. And, and they are a big believer in that. So uh, that's one big bubble that you've created for yourself. And I was very happy to be part of it. And in that sense, he's using bubble in a positive way, not a negative yes. way. And absolutely. Yes. No, absolutely. Maybe education in general is one gigantic bubble and all the other little bubbles mm. are inside. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Dixon, could you take the next one? Sure. Dave writes, all. <clears throat> I mean, the one hour and 10 minute of TWIV episode 929. And I thought to stop and tell you that some tremendous magic happened, at least for me, listening to this episode. I've been listening to Slavitt's podcast since Dr. Griffin recommended it, although I've got to say I wasn't going to listen to your interview with him tonight when the episode dropped, as I thought him to be a little um, milk toast. I was wrong. It was an excellent discourse, and he gave you a raw perspective that I haven't really seen before. I know MBAs can be annoying, but it isn't just bits of sneaky genetic stuff that viruses exploit us when they do. Just throwing in my two cents, Dave. Um, by the way, this um, Kristen mentioned that, yeah, we said early on that the vaccines would not prevent infection. And, and Daniel last night, he, he has transcripts of his clinical updates. He found where he first said it, like in February of 2020. Alan has said it. Uh, Amy has said it on the live stream multiple times. So I'm trying to figure out how to get this to... Andy, because he said, send it to me. I'll listen to it. Yeah. But I don't have his email because his PR person won't give it to me. So, uh, really? you know, I have to. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of silly because our, people can contact us, right? Anyway, 
Uh, he he did want to hear it, and we did. He's say a bigger it. star than we are. Yeah, well, he is a big yeah. star. But you know <laughs> what? Um, I I resent the fact that he said you may have thought you said it, but you didn't. And no, we are virologists. We said that, and we said many other things. So he needs to know this. The problem is that we we have tens of thousands of listeners, not millions. Yeah, but of the listeners. problem is also That's that he thinks he has experts that he talks to, yes. but he doesn't actually have experts. <laughs> They're yeah. experts in different fields. So. He needs to hear that we did say it and that our listeners understand, right? Like Kristen said, yeah, you did say it. I remember that. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Vivian writes, Dear Vincent and crew, I've been a steady follower of your podcast since April 2020, and I am deeply grateful for all of the thoughtful instruction and commentary you have provided throughout the COVID pandemic. You have been careful to educate non-scientists like me who started out this pandemic not knowing whether an epitope was a foreign substance or ge something generated by the human body. When I first listen started listening and heard the term IL-7, I thought you might be referring to IL-7 and wondered why you might be talking about IL's in a grocery store. Um, just so you know, Vivian, um, I've actually had that confusion myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, having served on many NIH study sections, I also thoroughly enjoyed your detours into discussions on the research grant process. It is indeed hard to get novel, risky ideas funded. Over the years, I learned that I needed to put much more time and preparation into arguing for a proposal that I thought should be funded than in criticizing a proposal that I didn't think warranted a favorable score. Even with the requirement that we include the innovativeness of a proposal in our assessment, it never seems to get the appropriate weight. Perhaps a completely different set of reviewers should be asked to rank proposals only on their riskiness, just how uncertain we are about what the final study result would be, and factor that into the final score. I listened with great interest when you said that you had decided not to get a second COVID vaccine booster. I agree with your reasoning, and I have chosen not to get a second booster either. I'm in my late 50s, and I'm generally in great health, although I had major cancer surgery in early 2019. No recurrence, thank goodness. Could you please tell me whether you plan to get the new booster shot when it becomes available in the fall? I get a flu vaccine every year. Most of the time, the flu vaccine slows me down, and my second Moderna shot and the booster were real doozies. The COVID vaccines incapacitated me for a full day, and I didn't recover my full energy when exercising for a month each time. I understand why Daniel Griffin had to make a different choice, and you can explain that better than I can. I guess you don't have to read this email on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to every single episode. So if you do get the fall booster, please make sure to mention that on one of your episodes. Best wishes, Vivian. Epitopes. One of your epitopes. Oh, one of your epitopes. <laughs> oh. yes. So you automatically corrected it. Spell checker. I did. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting, this uh, riskiness factor, right? Mm hmm It's not a bad idea, actually. No. But I just think everybody would have a different assessment of risk, right? For a proposal, that is. I'm not sure how that I don't know. Correct. Yeah, Probably. That's, I think that's that right. there would be some set of proposals that most people assume or would say we're pretty safe. Um, and outside of that group, I think there would be big differences in the assessment. Yeah, I, I was always amazed at people's willingness to express their belief that this proposal, while it's well written and all the science is good and it will work, is meaningless in terms of the future of whatever they were writing about. And how can you possibly assess the future, not risk in this case, but rather benefit, of a grant which seems meaningless at the time, <clears throat> but to change amino acid number 63 to number 64 uh, may seem trivial at the time, but it could alter the entire course of human history if it's of the right epitope. <laughs> so I think predicting the future based on the fact that you just don't think it's important is absurd. I think... You have to judge the science and say it's good science or it's bad science because they're leaving things out. That's the way I assess the grants that I, I reviewed. And if it's good science, it's worth doing, period. Yeah, it's it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Ex exactly. Well, historians are having trouble even about the past. <laughs> so, um, Vivian, I – I thought there was good – this is just my feeling here uh, or my thoughts. Uh, there was good evidence that 
the first two shots worked right from the trials. <laughs> that was quite yeah. clear. There was, and we talked about the evidence that the booster rounds out the antibody repertoire, so you now neutralize more variants. But I don't think there's compelling evidence that the modified BA45 booster in the fall is going to do very much. And I agree with Paul Offit uh, on that. And that's why I wouldn't get it unless Columbia makes me get it. And <laughs> they might. <laughs> Who knows? But um, uh, that's what I think anyway. I'm probably going to go ahead and get it. Um, I mean, yeah, it's I, I had the Moderna flu badly after the second dose and kind of crummy after the third. But the Moderna it's, flu. Hey, do you, you see? Yeah. They're, yes, they're, there's, yes. A, there's a disease in China they're calling tomato flu. It's just hand, foot, and mouth yeah. disease. But yeah. well, have you seen that Moderna <laughs> is suing um, BioNTech oh, yeah, and they've, Pfizer they've, for stealing their design? I thought yes. that was a cooperative effort that was funded by the government. And everybody was sharing data. Well, yes, but also these are companies, and they need to protect their proprietary Moderna interests. was barely the, a company at the time it started. Well, they need to protect their interest in the technology, mm. um, which is fundamental to their future. And so, yeah, they're, this mm. happens. It's interesting because if you remember the guy we had on who wrote the book about the vaccine development, yeah, Greg something, mm. Mm. the shot heard around the world. Anyway, apparently they worked on it independently, right? I mean- Look, mRNA vaccines that was published, right? So I don't know what. But there are also there there are a bunch of patents, and this is for the courts to figure yeah, let the out. Yeah, the courts and figure Moderna, it out. Right. Moderna's lawyers apparently felt that what Pfizer and BioNTech had done uh, infringed on their patents. Okay, fine. And I guess they didn't make. Yeah, I mean, money. And, and as a publicly traded company, they are required to defend their. Be diligent about this patents. sort of thing and sure, defend their sure, patents. Sure. And so okay. here we are. Uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Yes. Uh, Charmaine writes, hey, Alan, next time you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, visit the Hiller Aviation Museum in San Carlos. Just went and it was fantastic. And I'm not even an aviation enthusiast. Many historical planes and reproductions, really well done exhibit explainers and photos describing how a particular aircraft was used and why historically and or technologically it was important. Fascinating and fun. Uh -huh. Very cool. Thank you, Charmaine. I will try to check, try to remember to check that out. So you have a list now because I told you about the one in Dayton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, actually, I've actually been to the one in Dayton. The one in Dayton um, is okay. a little more number important. Number of years ago. <laughs> um, Dayton, Dayton's, a, yeah, that's, that's a big one. That's um, a big one. It's also there's there's also an annual ham radio convention in Dayton that's mm. a, a big deal. But I've always enjoyed the um, aerospace museum. And there's the I'm still I still mean to get to the Udvar Hazy, um, the the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum's new um, annex that they've got at Dulles Airport, and I'm down in that area frequently enough that oh, right. I'll probably get to that right. soonest of these. And David writes, hello, Twiv team. I enjoyed Dixon's discussion of the wonderfulness of big bands as well as of the terrible economics of such groups. I thought I'd let you all know that the 16-piece Birdland Big Band has a regular Friday 5.30 p.m. gig at the Birdland Jazz Club on West 44th Street in New York City. Now in its 21st year, they benefit by not traveling much and by being in New York City where there is not only a ready pool of great jazz artists, but there's also a ready pool of gigs for the band members to be able to make a living during the rest of the week. Big bands are loud and Birdland is not large. And I've been able to sit right up front, just a few feet from the players. And one of the things I've noticed is that the conductor <laughs> and most of the band members wear earplugs. That's right. You can That's see right. just how close you can get in this video that I took in 2014 and watch for the saxophonist in the center adjusting his earplugs before they start. <laughs> well, Dixon, uh, 44th Street is not far from here. 530, nope. we can just go after TWIV. We should do that. If you come here sometime and do TWIV, yeah, it's kind of tight, I guess. I must tell you that the original Birdland was much smaller than the Birdland that you can now visit. It, you had to walk downstairs. It was a very crowded space. Thank God there were no fires. Uh, and they had a place for all the, the underage kids mm -hmm. to sit and listen to jazz. They call it the bullpen, where you could uh, drink any soft drink you wanted, but you couldn't have any liquor. And uh, <clears throat> there was a song that Count Basie used to play, and we put words to it 
Uh, and I forget the name of the song, but it's a quite popular song. I think it was written originally by Neil Hefty. And it, it, the words were, you, you can't get drunk on ginger ale. And um, <laughs> a lot of kids brought their own, as I would say. So we, we didn't exactly adhere to the rules in that regard either. But it was quite a, quite a place. And this Isn't one there is, a jazz it, piece called Birdland? As oh, yeah, well, sure. sure. Tribute to the yeah, Birdland is named after Charlie Bird, or Charlie Parker, rather, uh, who played like a bird. Uh, just okay. his music was so melodious and so <laughs> ethereal and so vari- varied that they started to just call him Bird. And this this new Birdland. So the club went out of business. I mean, to your economic point, didn't they go no, out of well, business? The owner was knifed. And then come back. The owner. Oh. the owner was knifed. Ooh. and he closed the place like the next week. I think his name was Zacharias, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'd probably quit a business after being stabbed. Yeah, he says that's enough. I've I've seen yeah. enough. Hmm. All right. And uh, the Colony Record Store across the street closed as well. Hmm. Let's do some picks, Dixon. That's a yeah. good segue for you. Speaking of jazz, uh, we've now covered all the big bands, and we now move on to the small group. Um, oh edition of jazz players and I'm, I'm saving the best for last and I won't tell you who it is but I there's a, a super gene <laughs> for having started all of this to begin with and that name will will emerge on the last pick so this this pick is a um, the best small group that I've ever heard. It's called the Miles Davis Quintet. It consists of Miles Davis on trumpet, John Coltrane, tenor sax, Cannonball Adderley, alto sax, Winton Kelly and Bill Evans both playing piano in different sessions, Paul Chambers on bass and Jimmy Cobb drums. The signature album is called Kind of Blue and the signature song is called So What? Many jazz enthusiasts think this is the best jazz album ever recorded, and it was recorded not far from where I live in Fort Lee, in Englewood Cliffs, at a place called um, uh, Rudy Van Gelder's, and he designed his uh, recording studio after a um, Frank Lloyd Wright-designed home, and it's an amazing studio, and all the jazz musicians came there to record their best work. So... So uh, this is quite an album, and I'm I'm so pleased that that these result in your putting the song, the signature song, online as well. And you'll just you'll love this song, and if you haven't heard it before, yeah. it'll uh, give you it's, an earworm. You know, kind of blue uh, is fantastic. Just, it's fantastic. Kind of blue is a great album. It's great awesome. Album. I love it. By okay, the way, I'm Dixon is do. Keith Coltrane going to be on your list? Oh, yeah. Coltrane is there. Coltrane is on this list right here, but when we get to the instruments, we haven't even oh, done yeah, that that's yet. right. He's there. <laughs> no, John Coltrane here. <laughs> this could this go is on the, for a long Keith, time. <laughs> Keith is a pianist. No, Keith Coltrane is a pianist? No, no, no. Um, you're thinking of um, oh, Keith Jarrett. Keith Jarrett, yes, I am. Absolutely right. Keith, the, uh, Keith Jarrett has had two strokes, and he can no longer play the that, piano. But they see on your list. Which is very sad. Uh I, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have piano players coming up. Don't worry. All right, you'll, thank you. No, no problem. You'll be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> thank you, Dixon. Keith Jarrett is a Jersey boy. I think that's why you mentioned him. No, his uh, his Live in Cologne album. Oh, that just came out. That, that just no, came it didn't out. just come out. I used to listen to it years ago. Live in Cologne no, is amazing. There's another one. There's, he played a concert in Cologne. One. It's actually the title is Live in Cologne, but it's amazing. And does, he okay. makes noises okay. as he's playing because he's so into it. Yeah, he got to stop that. He got to stop that after a while. <laughs> it was very annoying. Very annoying. Anyway, uh, thank you, Dixon. Brian, what do you have for us? <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, so I have an article about an event that um, <laughs> I was highly surprised to learn existed. Um, this article both tells you about the event and links you to a video where you can uh, watch some of it because, in fact, it was covered on uh, ESPN to uh, with announcers um, and sort of all of the things of a major sports championship. <laughs> and this is the World Excel Championships um, using Microsoft Excel, the program that uh, many of our listeners may have used that I use uh, very frequently uh, every day, um, where the uh, competitors are given 
um, a series of puzzles that need to be solved in a certain amount of time and need to use their Excel skills to solve those puzzles. Uh, I couldn't believe that this existed. And I was rather shocked. And I also uh, didn't realize that my entire professional life, I had actually been training for this championship. Um, so I hope that all of our listeners who use Excel all the time, like I do, um, re- now see what their skills can uh, can lead them Amazing. to. So when you look up the word Excel champion in the dictionary, I have no doubt that in another 10 years, Brienne's picture will be right next to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cool. And then I will, then it, you know, I'll feel better about all the spreadsheets I spend time on. <laughs> yes. So this is the next game show you're going to be on. Perhaps. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that could happen. Kathy, what do you have for us? <laughs> so I sent two things that were sent to me by uh, Justin. So thanks for that. Uh, one is a background story about the liar bird on NPR and it mentions a couple different videos. One is a David Attenborough video, which is the second link that I put in. And I don't know how I miss knowing about lyre birds all my life, but these birds are just amazing mimics. And in this Attenborough uh, YouTube, you hear it making camera shutter noises and then um, an an automatic winding camera noise. It, among other things, and it's just really fascinating. And then um, Dixon put in that the lyre bird is the Gerald McBoing Boing of the animal kingdom. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know anybody else knew about Gerald McBoing Boing. It was a, it was a book that we had growing up when I was a kid. But um, uh, Dixon put in a link to a cartoon. Uh, I didn't know yep. Gerald mm, McBoing yep. Boing was a co- cartoon too. You might want to mention that the lyre bird is a native of Australia. Right, right. I am so glad that we did not have these in Washington Heights when I was going to graduate school. Absolutely. (laughs) They would have been on nonstop car alarms and Mr. Softy ice cream truck. Firearms (laughs) discharging. And and merengue music. Yeah. 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 Well, I took a lot of walks in the woods when I was on my sabbatical in Melbourne, Australia, and I encountered a lyre bird once. That my friend pointed out to me, although I thought we were still walking next to the highway because I could hear cars going by. But it, we were quite a ways away from the highway. And he said, no, 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 that's a liar bird. <laughs> I said, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I almost said a bad word here, but I knew that Caleb was listening. I could not believe my ears. And then we finally saw the bird. And they have a big tail that curls up in both directions. And when they talk, they sort of wiggle all over. They're, their whole body wiggles. And they're, they're, they're quite phenomenal. Hmm. Quite phenomenal. And, uh, it, it's kind of funny because the liar is spelled L-Y-R-E. Yep. But you could think <laughs> yes. about them as um, being a liar because liar, they're not. L-I-A-R. They're, oh, they're that's making great. a sound. That's that it, wonderful. Kind yeah, of that's, putting, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Alan, what do you have for us? I have a book I read a little while ago. Um, It's called The Kissing Bug, um, and it's by Daisy Hernandez. Um, So I'm picking this for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is a a really good nonfiction science book. Um, It's about Chagas disease, um, which... uh, Dixon actually just sort of name checked a few minutes ago when he was talking about possible cause of death of Charles Darwin. Um, and Chagas disease is spread by this insect, this triatomid bug um, that's called the kissing bug in South America where it's, where it's indigenous. Um, and Chagas disease is extremely prevalent throughout um, South America into Central America. Um it's a it's a uh, trypanosome disease. Dixon can lecture to you for hours about um, oh, Chagas disease. I'm, re- and, I'm fully retired. Fully retired. And, and, is in, <laughs> and it's a fascinating. I mean, these trypanosomes are fascinating in their own right, and I they believe are. there's been twip discussion of this. Um, yes, that's true. The um, one one of the aspects of this disease is that it becomes chronic. 
um, and can have chronic sequelae, especially um, heart problems mm. late in yes. life for people who've yes. been infected. Uh, in the U.S., we think of that as, oh, that's somebody else's problem. It's a tropical <laughs> disease, right? Um, but in fact, because there is such a huge Hispanic population in the U.S., many of whom were born and raised in the area where this is a prevalent disease, um, there are lots of Americans who have these sequelae late in life uh, from middle age onward. Um, oh, wow, you know, suddenly I've got heart trouble. Where is this from? And doctors in the U.S. are largely unfamiliar with it, despite it being a significant public health burden in this country. Um, and the book is about how that came to be and why it persists and what can be done about it. And um, Hernandez has a, has a great perspective on all of this and the complexity of it. It's it's a whole spectrum of everything from the biology to the to the politics. Um, and um, Dixon, I'm sure, is familiar with this book because he is, in fact, quoted um, in it. Really? Uh, he's, yes. <laughs> she. You may not remember oh, this, but no, apparently, two copies. <laughs> apparently, she interviewed you and um, I'll be darn uh, discussed uh, why you know why, why oh. is this not more widely taught in medical schools and and you gave the response that well uh. you know I have uh, this short course to teach all of parasitology to the medical students That's and true. i can choose one trypanosome and i cover african sleeping sickness because it's even bigger you know as a global health threat but yeah you know right. this is this is a big issue it's leading cause of my cardiomyopathy in the world yes dixon are, yeah, are these the reduvids there are other Reduvids. Reduvido. He loves to, he loves to say Reduvido. 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 <laughs> um, hey, yeah, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat, highly readable book, um, and I, I highly recommend it. Did she say why it's called The Kissing Bug? <laughs> yes, because um, it it when it bites, so that the, the uh, trypanosomes are spread actually in the feces of Indeed. the bug. Indeed. But what happens is people who live in uh, tropical countries where it's common, um, it often infests the uh, the thatched roofs of their houses. Yep. It feeds at night and it may yep. it will bite, you know, wherever. And then you, you've got this bite and you scratch it and you get it into your bloodstream. It can even, uh, you know, bite you on the lip. Um, but the, the bug itself kind of looks like it's kissing when it. Well, when you see the size of this thing, you 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 can't believe that you don't know that you're being attacked. Right. And it injects an uh, an anesthetic. The moment the proboscis goes into the skin, the anesthetic numbs everything. So it's 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 like it gives you a kiss. It's a kiss of death, basically. So you're sleeping, yeah. and at night it falls on your face, basically, right? From the roof of your... That can happen. Uh, to, yeah. that's Any, anywhere happen. on your body. It, yeah, yeah, it can sure. just get onto you because it needs well, to Well, of course, if you have that's a right. cover on, then it's going to be your face. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I yeah, and, and as it as it feeds, it poops to make room for the blood meal. That's right. Um, and you wouldn't normally, you know, scrape blood poop, uh, scrape bug poop into your, into your wound, yeah. but... Um, you know, you're asleep and you... Uh, That's right. Something. What is your I must add that Darwin did not die from Chagas disease, by the way. Okay. And uh, he, he had a chronic dyspepsia hmm. and it uh, plagued him all of his life, basically. Dyspepsia. Dick Dixon, Reduvids are true bugs. They are. They're hemipterans. Yes. So we say bugs, but most of those are not true bugs. Yeah, only the long proboscis, just like the lantern bug, the lantern mm -hmm. bug that's plaguing us right now. In terms, of, we've killed um, two of them already. The it's lantern you're talking about the, uh, the Asian lantern bug. No. Asian the, lantern the spotted, bugs. Spotted lantern fly. Spotted lantern, spotted lantern, spotted lantern fly. Yes, yes, called, yes, not lantern bug. Is that a true bug, Dixon? Yes, it is. Yes, it, it is. is a bug. Yeah, but that one sucks on plants, not people. Yes, indeed, indeed, it does. Cool, very cool. All right. Uh, it's a great so it's inspired. Great and that that is not a that is not a, um, uh, a kissing bug that the cat is chasing. What around is she chasing? That's a, <laughs> it's a it's a. Fortunately, it's a toy mouse that That's she's cool. got a so hold of. She's very of. active. She's very nice. Going nuts. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm inspired by Dixon. I'm going to do a top five of something, right? And I decided to pick detection, detective fiction writers. As I like detective fiction, although I haven't read 
any in many years. Um, but I used to read a lot <clears throat> and um, um, I was friends with Paula Trachtman when I was a postdoc. She was a, a PhD student in David Baltimore's lab. We used to talk about detective fiction. And um, so I want to share some of them with you. In no particular order, there are just five. Um, but the one I want to uh, tell you about today, actually I did pick before, uh, not too long ago. Uh, but this, these are the books, the Martin Beck series. So Martin Beck is a fictional Swedish police detective. And he is in 10 novels, which were co-authored by uh, Mai Showal and Per Walu. Uh, this is a husband and wife or partner, I'm not sure, a man and a woman who uh, wrote these. And they used to, they used to make an outline for the book and then they would each write alternative chapters, right? <laughs> They'd alternate the chapters. Really? Sure, uh, it's very good. It's a really good team. Um, and I've read all, all 10 of these. So they're what's called a police procedural novel, right? You have a crime and the police solve it. And I mean, in my view, there are two, two things that attract me to detective fiction. One is um, the writing is very interesting. And, and I like the writers who are very... Uh, bare bones in their writing, right? Not not a lot of elaborate writing. And the other is the characters. <clears throat> because if you have a series like this, so Martin Beck is the main detective, right? And you see Martin Beck over and over. But then there are a lot of ancillary characters that get developed. And you get to know them after one or two books. And I find this just really uh, fascinating. So uh, this one, so there are 10. The first one is Rosanna. Then the next one is The Man Who Went Up and Smoked, The Man on the Balcony, The Laughing Policeman, The Fire Engine That Disappeared, Murder at the Savoy, The Abominable Man, The Locked Room, Cop Killer, and The Terrorist. So they were published from 65 uh, to 75. Uh, and um, so, and you follow Martin Beck, you know, you, you get to know what he likes and what he doesn't like. It's really, I really like them. And let me read you the first two sentences of Rosanna. Chapter one, they found the corpse on the 8th of July, just after three o'clock in the afternoon. It was fairly well intact and couldn't have been lying in the water very long. I love that. I love it. Actually, it was <laughs> mere chance that they found the body at all and finding it so quickly should have aided the police investigation. And um, so this is translated from Swedish. And I also find that the translation adds something. I can almost imagine reading it in, in Swedish. But uh, I really like this series, and you can still get them. So this is like early Scandi noir, which is a whole yes. big yeah, it's thing, a big right? genre now, yes. Scandinavian stuff. I mean, now the most recent these uh, these Laura reads a these, bunch of this. The lady who killed the dragon, or whatever, you know. But they're just well, I don't like them as much. Tattoo. I, I have read those, <laughs> but they're not. They're, I mean, these are hard boiled. Okay, that's what right. the original American genre was: hard boiled fiction because they were tough characters. But the writing was very bare bones, and I really like that. I really right. like that very right. much. So, so uh, Martin Beck, my, my Showell, and Pierre Wallou, they, they epitomize that kind of writing and character development that I really like. Yes, Dick. Cool. So, Net, Netflix has a series uh, called Wallander, which is yes. well, absolutely amazing. And it's along these same lines, only it's, yes. you know, it's video. So, so um, I, have not, I have not watched... Any of these uh, TV or movies, but they they have made me movies and and TVs TV series about them. But these are these are a long time ago that I read them. So I will have some others, four others coming up as well. So, and if you have ones that you like, let me know. I, that would be interesting to hear your favorites. And we have two listener picks. John writes, Twiv team, I cannot tell you how much your podcast has meant to me over the last decade or so of listening as a GIS specialist who spends most of his time either mapping disease outbreaks or trying to model and understand the complexity of the interaction of social disparity in disease outcomes. Twiv has been a true voice of reason, education, and explanation, especially through the pandemic. In recent episodes, there has been a great deal of reflection from both the guests and the podcasters about the social, economic, and non-scientific aspects of responding to infectious disease outbreaks, how historical and past developmental 
Demographic and educational disparities are often the controlling factor in access to vaccination in modern health care. Your discussion reminded me of something Paul Farmer wrote in his book, Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds, Ebola and the Ravages of History. In it, he writes that two questions dominate social medicine. Why did Ebola spread so rapidly in some places and not others? Why did some die and others survive? His conclusions suggest, much like in our current SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 pandemic, that the answers to these critical questions are not completely scientific, but rather hint at policy mistakes, the influence of underdevelopment in cities and countries around the globe, and a lack of social justice and access to modern health care. For this reason, I would like to suggest his book as a listener pick, as it is at once a devastating critique of what happens when historical and economic factors are ignored and how they influence the spread of infectious disease, and a book that is sincerely is a masterpiece of empathiology, empathiology, expressing deep concern for those who are helpless in the face of something like Ebola. Thank you for all you do. Uh, John is a lecturer in spatial epidemiology and geographic information science at Johns Hopkins uh, University. That sounds like a good one. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a second pick from Carol. Hi, TWIV team. The night before listening to 929 Empathyology with Andy Slavitt, I watched the movie The Social Dilemma. It's a fantastic look at social media and how it's gone wrong. It features Tristan Harris, who was a design ethicist at Google and is currently co-founder and president of the Center for Humane Technology. His new venture is working to change how social media is designed, regulated, and used. Given the discussion you had about social media in the episode, I wanted to share this with you. You can find it on Netflix, and more info is at thesocialdilemma.com. Thank you for creating such fantastic content each week. All right, thank you. I have to take a look at that, too, because I'm very, after talking with Andy, I'm very interested in these issues. Social media messing everything up, right? Yep. That'll do it for TWIV 931 show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us questions, comments, picks, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, we'd love to have your support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to learn more about that. Dixon de Palmiers at trichinella.org, the living river.org. Thank you, Dixon. All good stuff. <laughs> Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Brian Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. And Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology, the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Jolene for the timestamps, and Ronald Jenkins for the music. And of course, all of you who support us, many of you really appreciate it. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.